Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another episode of the Talking Sira podcast. Uh, it's been a while since our last podcast. It's been uh, a few months now. I think the last one we had was prior to Ramadan. So first I'd like to apologize for the long delay since our last episode. Um, there's been quite a few things going on. But inshallah, I think uh, you know we'll try to get a bit more consistent and frequent with these podcasts uh, going forward and and publish episodes more more frequently. Um, if this is the first uh, episode you're listening to, um, I would encourage you guys to uh, go back and listen to the previous 14 episodes. Uh, this is episode 15. Um, and today we want to speak about um, how Yathrib, uh, which was a former name uh, of Medina, that we call today Medina, uh, how Yathrib became the grounds for the first Islamic state in the history of Islam and how the tribe of Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj um, supported Islam and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, I think uh, obviously with the, the, the delay we've had since the last episode, it would be worth doing a quick recap of our last episode. Um, we spoke about how the situation of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Mecca had become very dire, very desperate. Um, the Muslims had found themselves very isolated especially since uh, the death of Abu Talib, the death of Khadija, and how the Messenger really lost that support where he didn't have that protection for the da'wah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him permission to approach the tribes uh, during the Hajj season and seek protection of the da'wah. And one of the things we demonstrated in this last episode is that the support that the Messenger وسلم, was seeking was in order to protect the da'wah. It wasn't uh, for any other reason. It was to protect the da'wah so that he he could complete his mission, he could complete the transformation of the society. Um, and it wasn't about um, him obtaining power or leadership. It was merely so that the da'wah could be protected and he could fulfill his mission and complete uh, the stages required uh, to transform society. So he approached various tribes uh, and many of these tribes rejected him um, and a few tribes um, somewhat kind of accepted his call. However, they uh, they placed conditions um, on the acceptance. So it wasn't really an acceptance. It was, it was one which had a set of conditions. So um, for example, uh, you had Banu Kinda and Banu Amr ibn al-Sasa who who basically told the Messenger وسلم, that if they had accepted him, if they accept him, uh, would uh, you know would he give power to them after his success? If he became successful in the dawah, would he would he give them power after his death? Obviously, this was a um, a very insincere, insincere condition because uh, they were concerned with power and authority, and the Messenger وسلم, just responded back saying that. Uh, he could not promise such a thing and this you know power and authority this issue rests with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he rejected their offer um, and then you had the tribe of Banu Shayban who basically um, accepted however they, they they could only provide protection from one side from the side of the Arabs they couldn't provide protection from the side of the Persians um, and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa also rejected this because this was a compromise. This was uh, not what was required. You know, if if Islam was to be protected, it should be protected from all sides. So the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam really was rejected by and large by all the all the tribes and, and those who had some inclination of acceptance uh, placed certain conditions that the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam could not accept. Um, so. You know, th- this was uh, a rejection for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he, he had to return back to Mecca um, unsuccessful in his quest for protection of the Dawah. So th- the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba, they, you know, they remained steadfast. They continued to be patient in the Dawah uh, because they had reliance on Allah. They knew that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala would support them. Even though the situation in Mecca reached a standstill and the Muslims were, you know, isolated, uh, they continued to give da'wah wherever possible. They 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 continued to approach the tribes, uh, approach the people, and and they knew that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala would not abandon them. 
And soon enough, uh, the support of Allah came from a small group of around six men from the tribe of Al-Khazraj, um, from the city of Yuh- Yuthrib. And uh, the lesson really here for us to take is that um, as long as we are steadfast in our da'wah, as long as we continue with the actions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires from us, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will eventually help us. So the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, you know, he continued to approach the tribes. He continued to invite uh, people to Islam, despite having continuous rejection uh, from ver- various tribes and various people. And, you know, many of us may get very despondent, uh, fall into despair and feel like there's no change really happening and, you know, start to kind of give up. But the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and, and his companions, they didn't. They continued to remain steadfast. And only because of this kind of perseverance did the help of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala come from a place least expected. Uh, the tribe of Al-Khazraj, was, it wasn't a planned meeting. It was just... Uh, another example of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approaching tribes and, and asking them to embrace Islam and accept Islam. So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he visited the camp of Al-Khazraj in, in the Hajj season uh, at a place called Aqaba, Al-Aqaba. Um, and he asked them, uh, who are you? And they said, we are from Al-Khazraj. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked them, are you allies with the Jews? Because he knew that this uh, people, they they lived close to the Jews, uh, the people of Yathrib. And they said, yes. Uh, so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then said, can I, speak t- can I speak to you about something? And they agreed and they sat down on the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He, as he did with all the tribes, he invited them to Islam. And the thing to note here is that this meeting will, with Al-Khazraj uh, was very different to the meetings with the previous tribes, like the tribes of Al Kinda, Banu Shayban, and these tribes, because uh, as we said in the previous episode, that the meeting with these tribes were, was planned and it was for seeking of the protection of the Dawah. Abu Bakr had identified the various tribes that had the strength to protect Islam, and the the, the purpose of these meetings were was was primarily to achieve protection of the da'wah whereas this meeting with al-khazraj was different because it was just a, a generic meeting that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam had um, and he was just inviting them to islam he wasn't requesting them to protect the, da- uh, the da'wah he wasn't requesting and, and we'll see from the events that happen that even though you know it was a positive response uh, there was no protection of the da'wah required from them in the first instance so when the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam invited them to islam they they looked at each other. They they kind of glanced over to each other, the six uh, men, and they said, "By Allah, this is the very prophet of whom the Jews warned us about. The Jews had spoken about in the to the people uh, of of Al Khazraj and uh, Al Aws, of the people of Medina, basically uh, the Arabs. Um, they told them about a prophet that they you know was going to come uh, based on their scriptures." Um, and because of this, uh, Al Khazraj were aware that you know is this the same prophet that the Jews spoke about and told us about, and so they accepted uh, what the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they embraced Islam. Alhamdulillah. So, Subhanallah, it was it was a it was quite a quick acceptance, and and it wasn't a rejection. They they embraced Islam. Six of these men, and they said to the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, "We have left our people, Al Aswal and Khazraj. They've left because there's only six six of them." Um, and they said that there are no tribes that are so divided uh, by hatred and r- rancor as they are. Um, and they said perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will unite them through the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa And if so, then there will be no man mightier than you, O Messenger. So they were telling the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa that, you know, the Jews warned us about you. Um, and you know, and that's that was one of the reasons they accepted the Messenger of Allah because they were aware of him. And secondly, that the you know the Aws and Khazraj they were in a bitter war. They were had various disputes, various wars, and they needed some sort of unity. So they saw in the Messenger of Allah Wasallam a figure, a, a leadership that a leader that could uh, unite them. Uh, and the, you know this was attractive to them because they were fed up of the war that they were having between the two tribes. Uh, 
So the six men from Al Khazraj they accepted Islam and they pledged to go back to the people uh, and spread Islam uh, amongst their close family and friends. Um, and they then then planned to meet the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam again the following year in the same time during Hajj. So this question arises really, why did Aus and Al Khazraj accept the message? Why were they so willing in comparison and in, in contrast to uh, the previous uh, tribes such as Quraysh, such as the, the tribes that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had approached for protection? Why, why were Al Khazraj so kind of eager to accept the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and did so quite easily? Um, and there are you know various reasons but there are a few that we can kind of highlight um, and the first thing is that they were fed up of the constant warfare as we spoke about uh, Al-Aus and Al-Khazraj there were two tribes and they um, lived in Yathrib and they were in constant warfare continuous warfare over petty things but they were just fighting uh, many of them dying and you know, it was a continuous generational war that they were having between each other. And essentially the people had become tired of this, of this constant warfare between the tribes. And so they were yearning for some sort of unity, some sort of peace. So when they heard the message of Islam, they thought maybe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would unite them through the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa And that's why they be, were more open to uh, accepting the message of Islam. The second reason is that they were familiar with the concept of uh, one God and monotheism. Um, it was natural, to, as in they lived amongst the Jews. And they were, you know, they had, uh, the Jews were the neighbours, but they, they interacted with the Jews quite a bit. So when it came to the message of monotheism, the Jews had already told them about this. And with the Arabs, they viewed the Jews as kind of superior to them because they were more learned, they had scriptures, they could read. And that's why when the Jews would say things, and even the Christians as well, uh, the, the pagan Arabs would probably give them a bit more respect from, a, from, the, from the perspective of that they were more learned than them. They had read scriptures. So they were actually familiar with the concept of Tawheed and the oneness of Allah. So when the Messenger of Islam gave this message, this message, this shahada, it wasn't an alien message to them. They had heard this message and that's why they perhaps were more willing to accept Islam than the previous tribes and the tribes of Quraysh and the tribe of Banu Thaqif and, and the various other tribes that had rejected Islam. And then the final thing really is that, um, actually there's a couple more reasons, but one of the one of the reasons that is that the state, the, the Jews had told them stuff in their conversations and their arguments actually with the Jews the Jews would make statements um, and they would say that, uh, you know, when they were arguing with Aus and Khajraj, they would say that uh, you know, the, the time has come for a prophet to appear. And when he comes out, uh, the Jews, they said, we will follow him and we will kill people like you. So the Aus and Khajraj, they were aware that, uh, uh, you know, the Jews were speaking about this time has come for a prophet to appear. And that's why in their statement, when they accepted Islam, they said that, uh, you know, this is the person the Jews has Jews have warned us about. So let's rush to accept him before the Jews. Because they wanted to kind of, uh, kind of hit back at the Jews, perhaps, um, to say, look, we are accepting the, mess the mess messenger, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before you. And, and, you know, they did. And the Jews ironically rejected the messenger even though they knew about his arrival and they they saw that their scriptures had predicted this uh, arrival of the messenger sallam they they still out of the pride that he came among the arabs they rejected the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam so so this is another reason why uh, they accepted the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they accepted islam that the jews had already given them some sort of forewarning and the irony here is that you know, the Jews un unwillingly, unknowingly assisted uh, the Muslims. They assisted the people of Yathrib. Um, and this, you know, this is sometimes happens where it is the plan of Allah. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ That uh, they plan and Allah plans and Allah is the best of planners. That, you know, the Jews, they didn't know that they were inadvertently um, you know, giving advice to 
the people of Yathrib. And due to this, the people of Yathrib accepted Islam because, you know, the Jews were, um, you know, had the, the intention to kind of mock the Arabs and mock the Aws and Khazraj. But in fact, they they helped the Arabs kind of could be convinced of, of the message of Islam. Um, and then the final thing really uh, to highlight why Aws and Khazraj and, and particularly the Khazraj in this scenario of the six people accept, accept, accepting Islam um, is that uh, the the uh, you know they were in war with each other like we mentioned, but actually um, before um, the Hijra uh, there was a battle called the Battle of Buath, and this occurred between Al Aus and Al Khazraj, and it was a very violent battle. Many of their leadership had passed away and died in this battle, so both of these tribes. Um, who um, had leaders who kind of represented the old God and the old way of thinking, these people had died in this battle. So they were looking for a leadership. And the new leadership amongst al Aus and Khazraj, they were actually a, a younger generation and more open-minded uh, rather than kind of the older generation who was stuck in their ways. Um, as we've seen, with, you know, we can make comparison with the, with the Quraysh. They had... Um, People like uh, Abu Jahal and uh, uh, Walid bin Mughira and Abu Lahab and these people who were very adamant in their ways and even though they knew, knew the truth of Islam, they, they were rejecting Islam because of their pride. Um, and this is uh, another lesson that we can take from this incident that you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us and warns us about the al-mala, the people of leadership, the chiefs who were the most ardent in rejecting the message of Islam and met the message of truth as we had with previous um, prophets and previous anbiya. And that's because they have the most to lose from accepting Islam. They, you know, they gain from the status quo. They are the ones that are making the most from the status quo. So if now, uh, you know, someone has come to destroy the status quo and destroy their, their status and wealth, um, then obviously they have the most to lose and that's why they put up the most resistance and uh, we will speak about it later about how when al-mala and the leadership accept islam and accept the truth actually it has a greater impact for the dawah it has a greater positive impact in the same way that when they reject it it has a great negative impact um, so the Quraysh and the other tribes who had rejected islam they had this type of older leadership who were set in their ways and the al-mala who basically uh, didn't want to lose the status quo. They didn't want to lose what they had. So they, you know, they rejected the truth despite knowing it was the truth. Whereas the leadership in Yathrib, they firstly, the old God had been killed in this battle of Buath and also the new younger generation, they were more open-minded and they were less established. So... Uh, we'll find out in some examples that we'll speak about how they were more open to hearing about what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to say. And for these four reasons really, the Aws and Al-Khazraj, they were more inclined to Islam and more open-minded to accept Islam compared to the Quraysh, compared to Banu Thaqif and compared to all those tribes who had rejected uh, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hajj season. Uh, and this was a, you know, a support from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From, from the least expected place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them the Muslim support from the, the tribe of Al-Khazraj initially and then al as we will see. Uh, and they attained the name of Al-Ansar, the supporters, the helpers, because they helped and supported the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we, as we will see. So... This first um, occurrence of the six al -Khazr of from the Al-Khazraj uh, th that, that uh, met the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke to him and, and, and accepted Islam. It occurred in Al-Aqaba, but it wasn't the pledge. There was no pledge that took place. Um, all they did is they returned to their people and they committed to kind of speaking to their families and close friends uh, and spreading Islam. And they did do this, they, they, they stuck to their promise and they went and they invited people to Islam, the new deen that they had discovered and heard about from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they invited people. And, you know, they were quite successful in this. Many of the people started to accept Islam. And a year passed by uh, and the Hajj season came upon them 
and they obviously came back to Hajj instead with with 12 people. So there were initially six in the first meeting, but this meeting now there were 12 of them. And the, the six original people that came for the first meeting, they were there, and then six more. And uh, this following year, actually, uh, it wasn't just the tribe of Al-Khazraj. Um, of the 12 people, there were 10 from Al-Khazraj and two from Al-Aws. And this really indicates two points, that firstly, the dawah efforts uh, of the six men was were, were firstly kind of concentrated uh, amongst the Khazraj, which which is natural because, you know, that's who, who their friends and ties will be with. So the, the predominant ones, 10 of the 12, were from Al-Khazraj. But the other thing that it really highlights and indicates is that, you know, two of them that came to this meeting were from al Aus. So that must have meant that uh, there were, was some sort of breakthrough in the Khazraj convincing people from al Aus to embrace Islam. And this is significant because obviously we know that these two tribes were at war with each other. They were at battle. There was obviously animosity between these two tribes. And, uh, you know, this this wasn't, it was still raw within them. So this was a, a, a significant breakthrough, uh, and the first sign of some, you know, new find, found unity amongst Al Aus and Khazraj, who were obviously at war with each other previously. So this was this was, um, you know, quite significant uh, to to know that they they had success in kind of breaking through to Al Aus. So they met again in the place of Al Aqaba, but as I said, this time they made a pledge of allegiance. Uh, which is referred to as Bayatul uh, Al-Aqaba Al-Ula, the first pledge of Al-Aqaba. Um, and it's also known as Bayatul Nisa, uh, the pledge of the women. Because this pledge, this first pledge of Al-Aqaba, they, um, it didn't include fighting. It included uh, certain kind of commitments, but nothing to do with fighting. So, you know, the, the what it included was for the these people, to, uh, the, the the new Muslims of Medina, of Yathrib, to to not associate any God with Allah. So this was obviously the Shahada. Uh, to not cheat or fornicate. Uh, to not kill their children. To not make any false accusations or slander. Uh, and to not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually in anything good. To, so basically to obey the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he advise them to do things so it wasn't much but actually it was the fundamentals um, of the deen so that they could go away and establish some sort of foundation amongst them that that early community in Yathrib and also when they're spreading it to other other um, people of Yathrib this was the condition this was the pledge that they made to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. so the messenger responded and told them that if you keep to these conditions you shall have paradise and if you give up on any of this and and you are punished for it in this world, then this would be the atonement for it. But if it's been of, overlooked and you're not punished uh, until the day of judgment, then it will be up to Allah to decide whether to punish you or to forgive you. So this was the pledge of Al-Aqaba Al-Ula, the first pledge of Al-Aqaba. And um, straight after the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, sent Mus'ab ibn Umar radiyallahu anhu to teach these new Muslims of Yathrib their deen and to teach them the Qur'an and also to support them in giving da'wah to others. Because it was essential for this new group of Muslims that they were grounded in the fundamental Islamic aqidah. Um, as the Muslims of Mecca had previous um, you know, obviously they were, they were get, getting tarbiyah from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam directly. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent Musab, who was known for his kind of understanding of the Qur'an and the message of Islam. Um, he was chosen to go to the, to Yathrib and teach the people Islam and, and teach them the Qur'an and help them with the da'wah. So Musab, he lodged with um, someone called Asad ibn Zurara radiyallahu anhu and uh, he straight away began visiting people in the camps and households and reciting the quran and calling people to islam he didn't kind of wait he he he, he straight away uh, wanted to start giving da'wah and soon enough people started to embrace islam uh, until almost every household of the ansar of the aws al khazraj had muslims within it and Mus'ab really, uh, in his efforts, he epitomized the mentality of a da'i. 
and we can learn so much from him from his activities in Yathrib we can learn so much and apply it to our lives today you know he was very deliberate and consistent with his efforts of that were and he used immense hikmah uh, in targeting the right people to maximize the impact of the da'wah. Um, he was basically a real life translation and example of the ayah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, invite to the way of your Lord with hikmah and fair preaching and argue with them in the way that is better. And the story of how Usaid ibn Khudair and Sa'd ibn Mu'ad embraced Islam really brings this characteristic and the characteristic and mentality of Musab ibn Umar to life. Um, so the story as it goes, many of you will know this, but um, just to paraphrase, um, one day Asad ibn Zurara went with Musab ibn Umar to uh, an area, uh, like the quarter of the people of Al-Ashal, Banu Al-Ashal and Banu Z- um, Zafar. And they, you know, they went there in that quarter to speak to the new Muslims and to give da'wah. And whilst they were doing this, uh, Sa'd ibn Mu'adh and Usaid ibn Hudayr, they were the two leaders of their clan, the, the Banu Abd al-Ashal. Uh, they were the two leaders. They uh, heard about, you know, they weren't Muslim at the time. They were, they were still following the paganism of, uh, of the Arabs. When they heard about Mus'ab doing what he was doing, uh, Sa'd, he said to Usaid, he said, you know, go to them, go to Mus'ab, go to the people there who have entered our quarters and they are making fool of our people, fools of our people, and drive them out, forbid them from entering our quarters. And he said to um, Usaid, he said, um, if it were not that Asad ibn Zurara is related to me, because he was his cousin basically, um, he said he would, he would have saved him the trouble, um, but because I can't do anything to him, you go, you go and tell them to leave this location and, and, and to not cause trouble. So Usaid, he took up his lance and he went to them. And basically when Asad ibn Zurara saw him coming, he told Musab, he said, this is the chief of his tribe who is coming to you. So be true to Allah with him. And Musab said, you know, if he will sit down, we can talk, we can talk to him. So Usaid, he came over, he stood over them and he was furious, he was angry. He he said to them, you know, leave us uh, if you value your lives. Basically, if you don't go, we're going to kill you. And Musab said, look, won't you sit down and listen to us? Just just listen to what we need to say. And if you like what you hear, accept it. And if you don't like it, then, you know, leave it alone and, and we'll leave. And also he thought this is a fair, fair kind of, uh, you know, offer. And he agreed. And he put his lance in the ground and he sat down and he listened. And then Musab, he went on to explain Islam to him. And he read the, the words of Allah in the Quran and he even said, they said, afterwards they said, you know, by Allah they could see, as they were speak, saying the Qur'an and the words of Allah, they they could see and they recognized that Usaid's face had changed. And basically he had recognized the truth. So Usaid, he, after he heard this, he said, what a wonderful and beautiful discourse this is. What does one need to do to enter into this deen? Basically he wanted to accept Islam. And they told him that, you know, you need to make wudu, purify yourself, purify your garments. And bear witness to the truth. Make shahada and pray the two rakah. So he immediately did this and he then said, There is a man behind me who if he follows you, every one of his people will follow suit and I will send him at once. This man is Sa'd ibn Mu'ad, the person he was sitting with previously. So he took up his lance and he went off to Sa'd and he and when Saad saw him coming, he recognized that his face had changed a little bit. So he came up to Saad and, and, and Saad asked him, what's ha- what happened? Um, and he said, you know, I've spoken to the two men. There's no harm. I fa- forbade them to do what they needed to do. And, and they basically kind of accepted what I had to say. But he just didn't really answer the question. And then he said that, um, you know, I've heard that Banu Haritha, another tribe, had gone out against Asad ibn Zurara to kill him. Because they knew that he was the son of your aunt, meaning it's your cousin. Uh, and they want to make it appear that you're a treacherous guest. So he told a bit of a white lie to, for Saad to get angry and to go and approach um, Musab ibn Umair and Asad ibn Zurara. So Saad obviously got angered and enraged and he got up at once and he, he went over uh, to, um, you know, to, the, to Musab. And he went over to them and he saw them sitting comfortably. Uh, and so he recognized that Usaid must have just wanted to, 
him to come and see them and, and speak to them. So then he stood over and he said to Asad ibn Zurar, he said, Abu Umama, you know, were it not be for our relationship between us, meaning for, if we were not cousins, uh, you know, you wouldn't have treated me like this. Uh, would you behave in your homeland in a way we detest? Basically, he's saying that, look, you're taking advantage of our relationship. So um, Asad already, when, when Saad ibn Muad was coming, Asad to- told Musab that, uh, by Allah, this is a leader who, if, who um, is followed by his people. If he follows you, no two of them will remain behind, meaning his whole tribe will become Muslim if Saad becomes Muslim. So Musab said to Saad, you know, don't be angry, sit down, listen, and if you like what you hear, accept it, and if you don't like it, leave it, you know, leave it, and we will leave as well. Again, same thing happened, he sat down, uh, he listened to the Quran, and he, the exact same thing happened, he recognized the truth, and it could be seen in his face. And he again said, what a wonderful discourse, what a wonderful, beautiful discourse this is, what does one need to do to enter Islam? And they told him that he needs to make wudu, purify himself, purify what he's, what he's wearing and bear witness to the truth, take the shahada and you know pray the two rakah. And he did so immediately. Then he basically took his lance, went back to his people. He went back to his own people with Usayd ibn Hudayr. And they even saw him coming and recognized that something was a bit different. So he stopped by them and he said, O oh, Banu Abdul Ashal, how do you rate my authority among you? And they replied, you are our chief, the most active of our interests, the best in judgment and the, and the most fortu- fortunate in leadership. And he said to them, I will not speak to a man or a woman among you until you believe in Allah and his messenger Muhammad. And as a result of this, every man and woman among the Banu Abdul Ashal embraced Islam. So this subhanAllah really highlights that, you know, the the effectiveness of Musab but also the effectiveness of targeting the leaders targeting the chiefs as we spoke about the Al-Mala and here is a positive outcome that when Al-Mala uh, accept what the truth is then actually their people can accept and the, the barriers are less whereas when they don't they cause more barriers and you know stop the people from embracing Islam and, and embracing the truth so Musab he then returned to the house of Asad ibn Zurara stayed as a guest he continued to call people to islam and like i said you know most of the people of medina of Al- of the ansar the the uh, aus al khazraj they began to embrace islam and uh, musab ibn umair he remained in medina for one year amongst the aus al khazraj teaching them their deen and he saw the numbers of the people embracing islam growing day by day so the actions of Mus'ab really show how he was assiduous and diligent. Very, you know, he was clever in what he would do. He was intelligent and he was consistent. He continually, tirelessly, assiduously, basically, uh, gave da'wah to Islam. And he is an example of what we should be as da'is in our da'wah, as da'wah carriers. You know, even though the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not physically with him, he wasn't physically with him, he followed the guidance of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he was able to, to succeed, you know, in, in a matter of a year, he was able to succeed in transforming the society of Yathrib from kufr, from corruption and shirk to the purity of Islam. So this is, should be an encouragement for us that even though we don't have the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam amongst us here physically, we have his guidance, we have his sunnah. We have the guidance of Islam, the Quran and the Sunnah. And if we follow the method of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, to to the T, it correctly and understand what it is, then inshallah we should have the similar success that uh, Musab had. And, you know, the other thing that we saw Musab would do, he would he would find opportunities to contact people. Even if it meant kind of knocking on doors, he speaking to farmers, he would go to the farm, you know, farmland, speak to farmers. He would go to the busy places where people would, uh, you know, congregate. He would go to all these places to maximize the impact of his da'wah. And this is, again, something similar that we should have. We should think about what is that best style, that best means of kind of getting that message out there. How do we have the greatest impact on the da'wah? 
positive impact on the da'wah? How do we be intelligent? How do we use some of the tools that we have at our, 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 our disposal? Whether it be podcasts like we're doing here, whether it be social media, whether it be physical kind of attending you know, mosques or places where we know Muslims are going to be. How do we maximize the impact of the da'wah as uh, Musab ibn Umair demonstrated in, in these examples? And he also you know, confronted the leaders. He, confr- he confronted the influentials. He called them to the deen of Islam. And that's because he acknowledged that uh, you know, if the leaders are transformed, if the leaders change, then it makes it much easier for the people to transform and em- embrace Islam. Um, and like I said, we can make a clear, clear comparison with Quraysh. You know, they, they were unwilling to accept the truth. And because they didn't accept the truth, they would put barriers up for the da'wah. They would place make it difficult for the Muslims, isolate the Muslims so that they couldn't give da'wah to their own people. They would tell people not to listen to the Messenger of uh, you know, based on lies, tell people lies, whether it be their own people or people who'd visit Mecca. So likewise, today we should recognize that you know, targeting the people of influence, targeting those who the people listen to, the scholars, the academics, the, the, you know, the, the people who have influence in society, you know, this by by targeting people like this, that will have the greatest impact on the Tao. Not not to say we don't target everyone. You know, everyone we should be targeting and speaking to about Islam and and the mission of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But we should also recognize that you know there are certain people, influentials that if we target, they will have the greatest impact because they are the ones that people listen to. They are the ones that carry that uh, influence. Um, and then you know, and finally, as we spoke about the Musab ibn Umair, he was, uh, you know, he he was intelligent. He performed some deliberate tactics to, uh, you know, to kind of um, have the the most success in the da'wah. So and to gain access to the to the right people. So what he did with Asad ibn Zurara in terms of accessing uh, Saad ibn Mu'adh and Usaid ibn Hudayr was an example of this. So through these steps. Uh, you know, Musab, like I said, in one single year was able to transform the thoughts in Yathrib from a corrupted idolatry and paganism uh, and incorrect emotions and thoughts to Tawheed, to to Iman and the Islamic emotions uh, were, you know, were created among, amongst the people. He had radically transformed that society and that people. So in conclusion, really, um, you know, we spoke about that despite the dire situation in Mecca uh, and the stalemate of the da'wah that the Messenger and his group had kind of come across, they remained steadfast. They continued to invite the people to Islam. And, you know, it was this through this consistent effort that Allah gave them a source of victory from a tribe who they, you know, they were, weren't a significant tribe. Six people from al Khazraj, they, they didn't really carry much weight in, if just from the kind of face of it. However, it was through this tribe that the success came, the victory came. And that's why today, you know, we need to be assiduous. We need to be consistent in our efforts. And we never know where that support will come from. But it will only come through action. Just sitting around and becoming despondent and not doing it is not the answer. We need to be persevere. We need to be steadfast and have sabr in our efforts. And, you know, the efforts of Mus'ab ibn Umair radiallahu anhu should inspire us. It should be an inspiration for all of us. You know, he was a single companion who acted on the guidance of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa And he was able to transform an entire society from kufr to shirk. I mean, this, if this is an, an inspiration, if this is an encouragement for us, then I'm not sure what is. This This really highlights that it is achievable. You do, we don't need to be prophets. We don't need the prophet among us. We can achieve it as long as we follow the same path that the that Musab ibn Umayr took in terms of following the Messenger Sallallahu his guidance and his method. And the thing I really want to end on is that you know, recently there's been some conversations in various podcasts and talks about whether the Islamic State can once again rise in our reality. Or, you know, the reality of nation states and the dominance of the US. You know, some people even describing the resumption of Islam, the resumption of a Islamic caliphate as a pipe dream that can't be achieved today. And, you know, the first rebuttal to this from my perspective is that, you know, such a position... Uh, is 
that you know re- resuming the entirety of islam um and including its systems and the laws of allah is an obligation so to call it a pipe dream or something that's impossible is not befitting for a muslim because it's an obligation that we need to resume islam it's an obligation that we need to implement the entirety of islam as a comprehensive system as a comprehensive state and all the laws that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed and obliged us to fulfill it's an obligation so this is probably sufficient to tell us why we can't have this mentality of thinking that resumption of islam and the islamic authority is a pipe dream how else do we achieve uh, the obligation of resuming islam how else do we achieve the obligation of re- implementing the laws of allah and the sharia of allah it's only through the establishment of an islamic authority establishment of the islamic state and secondly you know those who think that it's not possible to resume islam you know they're restricting their thinking their minds uh, to the current framework and the current reality today so when they think about the nation states the fact that uh, you know um you know the treaty of westphalia where you know countries can't kind of take over and and and, and the national borders can't be erased you know they're thinking that this can't change because you know this is the reality we live in today but this is a very colonial mentality where we we we're, 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 we're prisoned in this thinking of the current framework the current status quo cannot change the sira itself shows us that there was a radical and fundamental transformation of society in which all the previous systems were destroyed and they were replaced by the islamic system the aws and khazraj were hugely tribalistic most of their wars were due to the tribal affiliation that they had but they this didn't stop the muslims from destroying this false framework of nationalism and tribalism and replacing it with the bond of islam so if it was achieved then by the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam why can it not be achieved today of you know the nation states is the same principle the same concept it can be achieved today it's just that we need to take ourselves out of that restricted mentality that colonial mentality thinking that we can't question the the status quo and thirdly another key reason why we should be positive and not be pessimistic we should be optimistic is that we have allah on our side anything is achievable when we have allah with us you know no matter how dire or despair the situation becomes like the situation of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam that we spoke about the support of allah will arrive as long as we carry out the correct actions um and and finally the, the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know he he provides us with this clear method on how to transform society so he gives us this he's shown us the 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 steps we need to take in detail we know this through the sirah through the sunnah and some you know another thing that i've seen that some portray it as though there's only three ways that uh, uh, three methods you could call it of establishing the islamic state that are predominant today you know one is implementing islam through a militia or through through fighting like we had with the case of you know isis al qaeda and other various other militant groups who basically they just declared a state and forcibly into implemented islam on the people and what they say is that you know this has shown to fail because you know these groups have been defeated fair enough the second thing they say is that the second approach method is the pragmatic method of groups working within the system and then then hoping that the people bring to power an islamic group that will eventually you know through pragmatic means implement islam and you know again they will say this has failed as well because what you had with the muslim brotherhood in egypt and mursi who who got to power but because of the framework there and the us dominance that these groups were sidelined and and removed because you know they didn't fall in line with the american agenda so this is another example they give to say even this method fails because actually you know you can't change it from within and you know where where certain groups have attained power the islamists you can call it you know for example and nahda in tunisia you know the the example with them is that they changed 
themselves they you know now they don't seek to implement islam they have become fully secular and they accept the secular framework so again they, they claim that the second option of implementing islam has also failed because either either they were quashed or they changed themselves in the system and then the final one that i've heard again you know they they say that the final predominant means of establishing islam is to undertake a military coup and the saying here the kind of the the thinking here is that a muslim nation you know where you know the you know a power is given to a to another party or another uh, leadership through a military coup um and you know this would be the way to establish islam and and some you know they will say that some have tried this method in terms of doing a coup against the leadership but um you know they've been quashed the, many of those who have been involved have been imprisoned so again this method appears to be unattainable an, an unattainable approach to establishing islam so these three things are given as options to say you know these are the predominant means of establishing islam and they've all failed or they're all bound to fail and the thing is that uh, you know they conclude that then that means the state can never arise because all, all these three methods that are uh, in can in place today and the ones that are sought today have never occurred they've failed so that means the islamic state will never arise that that's the argument that's made but the thing we need to recognize is that all three of these options do not align with the method of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the actions of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and neither do they align with, with align with the actions we spoke about today in terms of uh, musab who was working on, on the guidance of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam in yathrib you know he transformed the thoughts and emotions of the society and he created a public uh, opinion for islam until the people themselves wanted to live by islam and under a leader he would implement the islamic system through the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam so can we you know hopefully i'm making it clear that this is not the same as the three methods that apparently are the three methods that um of establishing an islamic state that are exist in existence today you know it, this wasn't forced um musab ibn umar didn't force the people he transformed the people so actually it doesn't align with option 1 Uh, there was no kind of working through the existing system they didn't work through the existing system of yathrib to you know give leadership to someone they they destroyed the falsehood they destroyed the existing system and they replaced it with islam as we will speak about so again this you know option 2 doesn't really align with what really occurred and finally the third one the military coup also a military coup never occurred because the people were transformed first and then the leadership was given uh, as we will find out in a future episode the the leadership was given to the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam to implement islam upon them because they wanted it they were transformed it wasn't a military coup as some have described it um so you know rec- we need to recognize that um we should have a positive attitude towards the implementation of islam but also we need to follow the islamic methodology islam being a comprehensive system and state is an obligation but also we need to understand the method in achieving it the method of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and if we follow that inshallah correctly we will have similar results as musab ibn umair had in medina in yathrib and the muslims had overall uh, which we'll find out in the in the next episode Uh, when it came to the second pledge of al-aqaba i pray that you've benefited from the episode uh, inshallah please share uh, this with uh, with your friends and family and uh, you know we're available on youtube spotify and the, all the various podcast platforms uh, apple podcasts and google podcasts inshallah please uh, listen uh, and share with others aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'ir al-muslimin fa astaghfiruhu innahu huwal ghafurur rahim thanks for watching that video For more exclusive videos please like, share and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms. And for more voice of the ummah content, make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms in the description below.